and it will be available on Ali's website within a week. Uh, the agenda calls for self-introductions, followed by tonight's speakers, who are uh, Dr. Phil Willink, Dave McGowan, and Dr. Ted Karamansky. A Q&A session follows their present, uh, presentation. Um, so let's get started with self-introductions. I am Michael Bowles, Executive Director of the Association for the Wolf Lake Initiative. Uh, Phil? Uh, yeah, I'm a fish biologist with Illinois Natural History Survey, and then I'm on the board of Owley. And Ted? Hi, Ted Karamansky here. I teach uh, public history at Loyola University in Chicago, uh, lifelong South Sider. Uh, and I also teach American Indian history, something we'll be talking about a little bit later. Okay. Um, Steve? Uh, as Dave? Well, Steve, is it Pat? Pat, can you hear me? I don't think she can hear me. Uh, Dave? I'm Dave McGowan. My company is Ravenswood Media. I'm a filmmaker. I the films that I make over my career have been uh, environmental and conservation programs. I'm from Michigan City. I, at one time, I worked in the mills. And it's, it's a good point for me to, uh, to kind of bring my career to full circle and uh, re-examine what had happened in the Calumet region, its history. And to make that history relevant to a larger audience, a global audience, uh, by introducing this uh, new concept of the Anthropocene epoch. Okay, uh, Tyrone? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can, I can hear you, okay, thank you. And that's uh, Tyrone Haymore, and you're from, um, the Robin History Museum. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Matt, are you are you here? Nancy Walter. Eve. I'm here. Okay. Let me get this right here. Hi, okay. Nancy Walter. Okay, uh, Priscilla, Bob. I'm here, Priscilla. I just, uh, I live in the village of Michiana, Michigan. I'm not sure how I ended up on a mailing list, but it sounded interesting, so here <laughs> I am. All right. Well, uh, I, hope, I, I hope you enjoy it. I'm sure I will, thank you. All right, Lisa? Yes, I'm here, Lisa Soa Downs. I'm um, from the Hegwish neighborhood um, and everything about everything Calumet. And I am very active with the Cub Scouts, PAC 773. We hike, we hike all throughout the area, so. Okay, Bob? Oh yes, uh, Bob Florio. I'm using my wife's Zoom and I am a committee member that's working on the film that uh, Phil and, and David and uh, Ted are going to talk about. Okay, I think that includes um, everyone. Um, there's someone in the waiting room. This is Jeremy Strickland. I'm on. Okay. Oh, okay, Jeremy. And um, um, so um, I will welcome tonight's speakers who will uh, continue a discussion begun last month at Wild Things, gathering it um, about Wolf Lake Abides, people and nature in the Anthropocene. And Dave, do you wish to begin? Thanks, Michael. Yes, I would. Uh, so. Like I said, I'm a filmmaker and we're 
developing a one-hour documentary on the history of the Calumet region, but seen through the lens of the Anthropocene. I'm not sure, uh, you know, our, our members tonight, how many of them are aware of that term. It's a new term. It arose about 20 years ago when Earth scientists were having a debate about, you know, what was going on with uh, the natural systems of the Earth, uh, particularly with climate change. And as they were talking about it, a uh, scientist by the name of Kreutzen had uh, spontaneously came up with this concept of we're entering the Anthropocene, where uh, throughout Earth's history, the Earth itself, it, the landscape, had a carbon cycle, a nitrogen cycle, and uh, an oxygen cycle that ran pretty much on its own. And then uh, humans came along. And at first, it was uh, a minor change in the, uh, the landscape. Uh, but then as humans began to uh, evolve more complex technologies and, and science, they um, about the middle of the 20th century, we as humans had our activity had overwhelmed uh, the Earth's natural systems. And that's significant to the Calumet for two reasons. One is that this hyper drive of human activity, especially with hydrocarbons, was particularly robust in the Calumet in the 19th century. So the Calumet went from a uh, wetland forested area to a industrial behemoth like within decades it's just a really remarkable rise of industry uh, it's also significant in that how once those industries collapsed in the uh, late 20th century um, humans began to in the calumet began to reconsider their relationship with landscape and that's why we have a zoom tonight called calumet nature <laughs> something like calumet nature probably wouldn't have happened 100 years ago it wouldn't have been on anybody's radar but it is today because we are beginning to reflect on what has happened so i'd like to make a documentary a one-hour documentary that uh, demonstrates or shows this this arc in history from the Calumet being a uh, a wilderness as the last settled area in Indiana to becoming an industrial powerhouse and then becoming a spot where multiple groups have come in to reclaim this land that had this huge human footprint on it and thinking about how we can take what has changed and I don't want to use the word restore because it's not restoring. We'll never restore because nature is a, a moving train. It's always changing and we're part of that change. But now that we have this technological muscle, we can perhaps manage that change in a way that can keep the natural systems intact. So that's what our documentary is about. That's what we're trying to, um, to uh, develop right now. And if you're interested, there's a new website called wolflakeabides.com. And uh, you can go to that website and get a little bit of the background of the uh, of the film. Is that good, Michael? That's good. Thank you, uh, Bill. All right. Did I come in on time? 
You came in on time. Yeah. Uh, you actually had two seconds left, but anyway. So, Phil? All right, I will take over. And in case anyone is curious about my decor behind me, I'm actually in a hotel room on the Mississippi River in Minnesota for a conference. This is not my office or my home or anything like that. I've never saw this room until I walked in a couple hours ago. Um, with that, I'm going to start screen share. Let's see how this goes here. And let's see, is it up or not? No. Here, let's try this. Oh, wait a minute, got it. Okay, good. Now you, yeah, now you there have we, it. There we go. Let me try this. You can see that? Here, let me make this smaller. There we go. Does that work? That's fine. All right. <clears throat> um. So Dave touched on on some of the things that I'm going to talk about here. This is similar to a talk that I gave at the Wild Things conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, but it'll be a little different. And I think a lot of people that are on this um, presentation weren't there. So this will get everybody on, on basically the same page. And the idea behind this is that in order to understand why we are where we are right now, we should go back in time to see what happened and led up to this. And then hopefully by studying the past and where we are right now, that will give us some ideas about what to do in the future. And th this particular talk sort of within the context of restoration, which Dave already talked about should be in quotes and that is why it's in the quotes in the title there. So to understand why kind of Wolf Lake is the way it is right now, there's a few things that I need to go over first. Let's see here. Whoops, why is this not working? There we go. Um, so here's Lake Michigan. Wolf Lake is down here. And then we have Chicago. The prevailing currents in Lake Michigan are uh, counterclockwise running along the west shore down to the south. And what these currents do is they pick up or erode the coast in Wisconsin, northern Illinois. They pick up the sand and the sediment. And then they carry it down to the southern tip of Lake Michigan and dump the sediment there. And they've been doing this for thousands of years and are basically slowly filling in the bottom of Lake Michigan. Uh, as you can see in this graph up on the top a few thousand years ago, Wolf Lake or most of the Calumet region was actually just Lake Michigan, all right? It didn't even exist. But then over time, as it slowly started to fill in, occasionally there were some bays. These bays would get cut off and then turned into lakes. And that's how Lake Calumet was formed. And that's how Wolf Lake was formed. And if you go through and you sort of date the vegetation down there, you would see that Wolf Lake is actually only around a thousand years old. So it's actually a pretty young ecosystem. Um, then we have some more information about Wolf Lake. This is a map from 1896. And although you can't read it here, these are all depth readings throughout the lake, transects of depth. And what they tell us is that the maximum depth at, in 1896 was only four feet. So it was a very shallow lake. It was generally only two to three feet deep. Uh, these pictures aren't showing up great, but basically Wolf Lake in 1913 in these photos was a little bit of open water in the middle surrounded by wetlands. Most of the Calumet area is wetlands in one form or another. There's a lot of aquatic plants. As you get away from the middle, there'd be more shrubs. And then further as the ground became more solid, you would get trees. So that's kind of base, where we were really starting. So if we look at time down here and kind of a, the ecological succession of Wolf Lake, it started off, you know, a couple thousand years ago as Lake Michigan. It was then a Bay of Lake Michigan. It was cut off, turned into an inland lake, and then was becoming basically a wetland. It was more wetland than lake at that point. And if you, and if this succession were to continue, this the lake would fill in, it'd be more wetland, the wetland would then become prairie, turning to savanna, then to forest. And this is based on a lot, on a lot of the work that was done in the Indiana dunes, and actually some of the work that was done in the Calumet region as well, this sort of succession of habitats. 
uh, that was all fine, except that the number of people increased rapidly a couple hundred years ago, and things changed. We can see in 1896, there's some roads and railroads and some buildings along Wolf Lake. By 1929, which you can't see, quite see up here, um, there's a railroad right through the middle of Wolf Lake. And then a lot more homes, industries, a lot of the wetlands are disappearing. And then the big change actually came in the 1950s in this map over here. And what happened then is Wolf Lake was divided into uh, a bunch of different pools. And these pools were dredged out to provide fill for the construction of the Indiana Tollway and the Skyway. And Wolf Lake, which originally was basically a wetland about four feet deep at most, was dredged out to about 17 feet deep. And uh, these levees were for construction equipment to go out there and take away basically the sediment to build the interstate. And this is more or less what Wolf Lake looks like today. Once again, with a lot more factories, homes, hardened landscape. Um, if we look at fish, and as it turns out, we have a lot of fish data. So this column way over here is scientific names. Here's common names. Don't worry too much about reading them. And then this column right here, um, are the species that were there from around 1898 to the 1930s. And we know this from various literature reports and also because someone at the Field Museum went down there and made collections of fish in the late 1800s. And those specimens still exist and are on exhibit in, the, in the, one of the museum's exhibits today and they're in the collections as well. So we know that this is what the fish community was like about 100 years ago. And that here's what it's like today. And this is like in the 40s, 50s. Here's what it's like in the 60s and 70s. And so what we see is sort of a transition of the fish community over time. And what we see initially with the first habitat modifications is that a lot of the sensitive species like black chin shiner disappeared about 100 years ago. They are very sensitive species, cannot withstand a lot of habitat modification or pollution or anything like that. And so they disappeared and we no longer have them in Wolf Lake. Then we have some like the bluegill that have been there through the entire history. These are pretty hardy, durable fish, can withstand a lot of types of different conditions. And then down here, we have the influx of a lot of things like invasive species, the round goby being notorious among them and sport fish. And kind of the main point here is that this, <clears throat> this change in fish community is a reflection of our impact on the environment and the various pressures that people have have put onto Wolf Lake over time and that those various pressures have changed over time. Initially, it was a lot of change in habitat. Later on, it was stocking of game fish and then later on it was invasive species. And the fish community has changed in a predictable, predictable manner associated with those pressures. So the biology is reflecting what we learned from the ecology as well. So if we go back to this map or this diagram uh, in the Anthropocene, and we didn't talk about it a whole lot, but there's a little bit of debate about when the Anthropocene technically started. So feel free to wiggle this line around a little bit. But when in the Anthropocene, when the human influences really started to escalate, Wolf Lake was reset from sort of a lake wetland back to an, an inland lake. So we went back to an earlier condition based on our activities in the past up to the present day. Now, the question is, what is Wolf Lake gonna be like in the future? And we don't really know. There's a lot of different opinions about this. There's a lot of different stakeholders, all with their particular interests. And we don't really know what the future holds for Wolf Lake. But I will say that because of the particular geomorphology, geology, um, uh, geography, hydrology, what have you. This is sort of the easiest path to follow this natural trajectory. And the further you get from this particular trajectory, the more expensive it would be to have that particular habitat. And by more expensive, I mean, in terms of funding, effort, people hours, what have you. So all these options are available to us, but this would probably be the cheapest one right there. Now, when we talk about restoration projects, uh, oftentimes our focus is in the here and now. And what we do is we, in the Chicago region, we look back a couple hundred years, maybe a few hundred years to see what the condition was like, and then try to restore it to this condition in the past. 
That's how a lot of restoration projects go. Now, I realize there are hundreds of restoration projects and they're all slightly different around here, but I, I'll say that this is a common one or a common way that a lot of people do things. Um, I have been suggesting that our focus should actually be up here. That is what various communities sh could become in the future. And that our focus in the here and now should be setting up the conditions, the fundamental processes, so that various ecosystems can continue along this succession successional uh, trajectory to what they would have become if people hadn't modified the environment in the first place. So in other words, restoration projects should evaluate the past. That is, we should think about the past, do not forget the past, learn from it, and use that information to inform what we're doing in the present. But the goal really should be looking at the natural potential of ver these various regions as to what they could become in the future with the realization of that what they may become in the future could be very different than what they are right now. And so this takes into consideration that nature is not static. It is dynamic. Um, it's in flux. It is always changing. Sometimes there's big changes. Sometimes there's small changes. But it is always changing. And that a lot of these changes are, are an artifact of human activities, which leads into the fact that human society is also changing along a trajectory. Uh, people's opinions change over time. Their attitudes change over time. And that this human trajectory is completely intertwined with nature, so much so that it is really impossible to disengage these. Uh, climate change is a good example of this, but I suspect that uh, with a lot of you that work in urban areas, you know that you always have to deal with the human element as well as the natural element, which combined we could basically call the environment. And with that, I'm going to end it here because I do not know so much about the human element and I will hand it over to Ted to talk more about people and then we'll see where the discussion goes. And let me do this. Okay, let's uh, try sharing the screen here. Is that... It's always tricky then to go back and try to get it to the slideshow. Okay. So hopefully everybody's seeing that. Um, and let's go back to the very beginning. <laughs> Obviously the glaciers, uh, huge ice sheets a mile thick, it created the Great Lakes. That ice sheet, which is sitting over the Calumet region sitting over Chicago begins to and is largely retreated by 14,000 years ago. By 10,000 years ago, you have people living uh, in the Calumet region. And as you can see from this particular slide, uh, the ice sheets may be largely gone, but the lakes are still evolving. And the human history. Uh, of Lake Michigan is longer than the existence of what we would regard as Lake Michigan today. People have been here uh, and shaping the region uh, while the region was literally being created uh, by nature. The other thing that this means, of course, particularly if you look at this uh, lower left slide of 7,000 years ago, uh, if you were a Native American living on the shore of Lake Michigan, well, you'd be 30, 40, 50, 60 miles away from the current shoreline if you were on the shore of the lake 7,000 years ago, because the lake had, uh, in that phase, the Chippewa phase, retreated so much. The point I want to make here is that Native people have been part of this environment since before this environment really existed as we know it today. And a key element uh, in this, of course, uh, is that as Lake Michigan uh, gradually changed, it retreated and retreated, and then sometimes it advanced and advanced. But in each case, it was leaving behind the former beaches. Hills, slight hills of sand thrown up uh, by the tempestuous waters of the lake. And on this uh, 
left side of this slide here, you can see uh, how an aerial photo reveals uh, these uh, uh, sand ridges. And these became absolutely critical to the development of the entire region. It is along these sand ridges that the first Indian uh, paths are created. It's along this that the first government roads are created. Michigan City Road through the region still goes along one of these beach ridges. The first railroads were along here. Uh, and it was on these beach ridges that the first settlers came uh, and built um, uh, their settlements. Now, one of the important concepts that I want to get across is this of environmental vision. Uh, environmental vision uh, is essentially what happens when a um, group of people look at a place and based on their economic and their cultural imperatives, they make a decision about how they're going to use the land. Uh, and for Native Americans, they looked at the Calumet region uh, and in a unique way, in a way that no other group after them uh, would attempt to uh, exploit the region because for them, they saw the advantage uh, of, of what's called an ecotone. An ecotone is a place where a series of very distinct environmental zones come together. Uh, and that was possible in the Calumet region because of the proximity to Lake Michigan, but also to those beach ridges. And so you have this topography um, of slightly raised sand ridges running through the region. And then between them, you have wetlands. Uh, and so by living on the sand ridges, Native American communities understood that they could exploit the fishing in nearby Lake Michigan. They could exploit uh, the waterfowl and hunting opportunities of the uh, wetland region. And they could plant crops on the sand ridges, particularly corn, which they were very adept at growing. Uh, this map uh, shows us the uh, range of one of the later prehistoric culture. So these are people here 10,000 years. So for millenniums, Native Americans uh, were, were living in this region, largely pursuing this environmental vision that, that I described. Um, it doesn't mean that their culture was static. A lot of things changed in those thousands of years. Religious practices, uh, settlement patterns changed. Uh, uh, this Mississippi in this later phase is the phase where they first begin to employ uh, the raising of maize or corn. Uh, uh, before this, they were, they were harvesting more wild uh, crops and the like. And there's a number of really important Native American archaeological sites in the Calumet region that allow us to tell some of this story. We get to the historic period, as this map indicates. Uh, one of the important things to realize about the Calumet region is that by the 1700s, the 18th century, the Potawatomi are sort of the main group uh, in this area. But uh, because of those sand ridges being very ideal for, uh, uh, for Native American roads and paths, Lots of groups are passing through the bottom of Lake Michigan. And the Potawatomi, they didn't have a problem with that. If the Ho-Chunk are, are, are passing through to go to Detroit or the Sauk and Fox, uh, or if the Dawa and Ojibwa people are coming down to want to even exploit the Calumet region, that's not a problem um, for the Potawatomi. Uh, all of these Algonquin uh, cultural-based tribes pretty well cooperated fairly well uh, with one another. This is the first map that indicates that this area at the bottom of Lake Michigan is something special. Uh, the, uh, this map maker in 1755, John Mitchell, gave it the name of Quadosh, uh, which was the an Iroquois name for the Potawatomi. 
but the French, so John Mitchell, the map maker, was an Englishman. The French, however, always called this area the Calumet. And that tells us something about the relationship of the tribes. This place is called the Calumet uh, because the Calumet, uh, uh, basically, you could say it, it's a peace pipe. But it's uh, the ceremony of sharing the Calumet from one group of people to another was a gesture of peace. And I think they call this the Calumet because there were so many different peoples that were moving back and forth through this area, largely in peace with one another. An important thing to realize about the Native American vision of the land uh, is that they had what was an ethical, not an ecological relationship with the environment. From a generally Native American point of view, all things that you see around you in nature have a spirit, a rock, a blade of grass, of course, a tree, a river, a lake, all have unique individual spirits. And respecting those spirits is critical to your relationship with the land in terms of subsistence, in terms of navigating travel over it. Uh, so you have to have this uh, ethical, spiritual relationship with the land. They didn't think about it in the same terms as uh, modern ecological science would describe the relationship between organisms. And this is what gets terribly disrupted when Europeans come in. Uh, and the first business in North America is the fur trade. And the fur trade is a capitalist international business. And it begins to inject a different set of standards and values into the region. Now, there's this myth that the Indians were dupes and they were selling these furs and, and, and getting cheated and all that. I think the way to understand, because the Indians for, for 10,000 years, they had developed a way to live on the land uh, without disrupting it. Now, why do they suddenly get involved in this commercial activity that's going to eventually destroy the uh, parts of the environment? Well, ask yourself how you got along so long without a cell phone. And now you may <laughs> be relying on it on an hourly basis. For Native Americans, they had a material culture that met their needs, but to suddenly be able to get metal tools, firearms, and especially cloth, these were revolutionary items that made their lives so much easier. Another important change that came with this fur trade was the role of women. Women suddenly became uh, much more important uh, because women, you're now trapping more furs than ever before. Women are the ones who process the furs. Women also were sought by fur traders uh, as wives because then their families would be guaranteed customers. Indian families liked to have uh, one of their tribe marry a fur trader because it guaranteed them access to goods. But there was a really, really dark side to this whole exchange. Uh, and that is Indians only needed so many wool blankets, only so many knives. A hatchet could last two generations after all, a copper kettle the same. And so the fur traders introduced the sale of alcohol. And so many of the founders of Chicago, Gurdon Hubbard, John Kinsey, Jean-Baptiste Pointe de Sable, they profited from the sale of alcohol to Native Americans in a way that degraded uh, uh, their culture. It also, the trade degraded the environment. Beaver were the most sought after furs and they were basically exterminated uh, from the Calumet region for quite a long time in the 18th and early 19th centuries. That change is, makes, has an environmental impact because beaver ponds would go ahead and slow the flow of streams uh, going into the lake. Uh, now the streams with no beaver ponds interrupting their flow would come, streams would move faster into the lake and they would deposit more soil in the lake and this would go ahead and make the lake less clear, which would affect the spawning of certain species of fish. Um, 
moving along a little bit quicker here, Native American people, there, there's not many big Indian battles in the Calumet region. They don't need to because they fought the Americans and tried to keep the Americans away much further. They didn't wait till they got to the Calumet. And the greatest Native American victory in our history uh, was the Battle of the Thousand Slain in 1791, where uh, Indians from the Calumet cooperated with other Northern Indiana uh, Indians uh, to defeat an army of 1,400 American soldiers. However, the Americans did regroup and after the Battle of Fallen Timbers, uh, defeated this coalition of Native American tribes, enforced upon them in the Treaty of Greenville, the first of a whole series of land sessions that would eventually alienate uh, the, their homeland from most of the Native American inhabitants of the region. And you can see where the red arrow is pointing. The first of those land sessions was a piece of land six miles square at the mouth of the Chicago River. Um, and that was, of course, the future site of Chicago as part of this 1793 treaty, 1795 treaty. And it was followed by all kinds of other land sessions. Relentlessly, the United States government was pushing Native American peoples to go ahead and give up, just give up a little bit more, just give up a little bit more. Uh, it was basically salami tactics of disinheritance. And the ultimate one, uh, for our purposes was the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, uh, which alienated the last of Native American holdings um, in the Chicago and in the Calumet region. And the peoples who lived there, some fled northward into Canada uh, and into northern Michigan, but most were uh, exiled by force. First to Iowa, then to Kansas, and eventually significant numbers to Oklahoma. Um, I don't think we have time for this. I won't get into the terrible suffering of the Potawatomi Trail of Tears. It wasn't just a Cherokee thing. But there was this remarkable fellow, Leopold Pokagan. And Leopold saw what the United States was doing, and he realized that he needed to get some European-American institutions other than the United States government on his side. And so he went ahead and developed a relationship with the Catholic Church, um, which while being a powerful international organization was basically reviled by most people in the United States in the 1830s. Nonetheless, with some of their assistance, he was able to press the negotiators at the Treaty of Chicago that, to allow his band of Potawatomi, the Pokagan band of Potawatomi to remain in Michigan. And uh, with funds that they received from the land sessions of the majority of their lands, they were able to purchase property uh, in Silver Lake Township near Dowagic, Michigan. And so there's a group of Native Americans who just a little bit north uh, uh, east of the Calumet region were able to endure in their homeland. And into the next generation, they talked back to the civilization of the white man. Leopold Pokagan's uh, son, Simon Pokagan, uh, wrote a half dozen books describing uh, how Native Americans viewed uh, their relationship with the United States. Uh, and this was particularly the case in 1893 at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, this great World's Fair that was celebrating 150th anniversary of the discovery of America by Christopher Columbus. And they asked Simon Pokagan, what would you say a few things about the Native American perspective? Hoping he would say something celebratory. Instead, he said, on behalf of my people, the American Indians, I hereby declare to you the pale-faced race that has usurped our lands and homes that we have no spirit to celebrate with you, this great Columbian fair now being held in this city, Chicago, the wonder of the world. No, sooner would we hold a high joy day over the graves of our departed than celebrate our own funeral, the discovery of America. While your hearts in admiration rejoice over the beauty and grandeur of this young republic, and you say, behold, the wonders wrought by our children in this foreign land, 
do not forget that this success has been at the sacrifice of our homes and a once happy race. But the Potawatomi, particularly the Pokagon, they persisted. And uh, you can see on the map on the far right uh, uh, where their uh, reservation lands, the tribal lands are today. But in addition to those tribal lands, they still assert certain treaty rights over a larger area that was session, that was seceded to the United States in 1833. And that includes some of the lands and waters in the Calumet region, uh, where under the Clean Water Act, they monitor uh, the, uh, uh, the health uh, of the waters uh, of their former homeland. And of course, there is a strong Native American community, not just in Dowagic, Michigan, but here in the city of Chicago, where I'm speaking from today. Over a hundred different Indian tribes are represented in Chicago. So most of these don't have that ancestral connection to the Calumet that the Pokagon Potawatomi have, but uh, they do represent uh, uh, a tremendous variety of Native American traditions. And we're talking about 60, 65,000 people um, in Chicago. Uh, and they remain uh, proud of their Indian heritage uh, and anxious to remind us uh, that when we come and go to work and home, it is to some extent on Native ground. Thank you very much to what I have for you today. And I'll go ahead and uh, try to end the share and leave it up to our next speaker. Okay, something's not working. Okay. Okay, I've, I've unmuted myself, and I'll repeat what I just said. Uh, um, anyone have a, a question of either three of the speakers? I was, um, Ted, that was... Um, um, I haven't heard that before, and um, I really appreciate um, the, the talk that you gave. And it was, um, um, I, I just know just a very little bit about um, Native American history and the kind that, and that filled in a lot for me. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's a it's a great story, and. But the thing about the Cali Meadows, there's so many other great stories um, <laughs> that, that come with it. So I can appreciate that uh, it's sort of obvious. Yeah, Ted, one of them is uh, Billy Caldwell. Right. Uh, how does he fit into all this? Uh, well, so Billy Caldwell, who was one of the founders of the Catholic Church <laughs> in the city of Chicago, uh, who was uh, uh, a uh, justice of the peace in early Chicago, one of the early, and one of the first voters ever in Chicago history. Uh, he had earlier opposed the United States. He was a disciple of the, uh, the great Indian war, Shawnee Indian warrior Tecumseh and fought with him. And only after Tecumseh's defeat uh, in the War of 1812 uh, did Caldwell then say, okay, you know, there's no keeping the Americans out. Let's see what we can do. And uh, he represented the Potawatomi in a number of Indian treaty negotiations because he spoke the language uh, of both the uh, Europeans and the Indians very well. When did he die? I have a quick. Pardon me? When did Billy Caldwell die? Um, he died probably about five years after the 1833 treaty. Uh, 
he had earlier been given a grant of land on the on the north bank of the Ch north branch of the Chicago River by the government. But when his people, the the Potawatomi, were um, exiled to Iowa, he went with them with his uh. entire family. And after a few years in residence there, uh, he died and is buried in Council Bluffs, Iowa. It's 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 intriguing to me that you know he there's Billy Caldwell Woods, there's uh, there's Caldwell that's streets and his legacy is in Chicago. It, you know how did how did that happen? That he it sounds like he he left Chicago and wasn't involved with its emergence, but his name keeps showing up. <laughs> Well, he was pretty involved until the removal treaty. And this was part, uh, Chicago, Chicago began as a multiracial community uh, in which uh, you had a very significant number of people like Billy Caldwell, who were of European and Indian origin. Uh, they were called the Métis. Uh, and so many of the early incorporators, founders of Chicago were Métis people. Uh, men and women. Uh, but when you had these New Englanders coming in uh, and people from, from upstate New York, those are the people who really begin to develop the, you know, the industrial side of Chicago. They don't, they don't see these, these brown-skinned people uh, as uh, their fellow countrymen. And they, they are made to feel unwelcome. Uh, and they get the notion, they understand that. That's why they go and stay with their Indian relatives following removal. And also the Baileys over in um, near Porter. I, I think there was a Native American connection with them too. Oh, definitely. Uh, but the Baileys, uh, uh, like Caldwell he and the Pokagans, the Baileys are, as I recall, very associated with the Catholic Church. Um, and uh, they're, they're, they send their school, their their daughters to uh, mission schools, and and it's, plus it's a way less populated area than Chicago, uh, where the ba the Baileys are. So they're able to stick around. I think the Baileys, though, later on, like later in the nineteenth century had disassociated themselves with any sort of native past. There was yeah. sort of a, a shamed of it or, or, or wanted to leave it behind. Yeah, that's, that's very true of, of those who stayed behind. Were the uh, Baileys also Medi? I'm sorry? Eve? Were the Baileys also Medi as uh, Billy Caldwell was? Uh, yeah, you know, I um, I wasn't prepared to talk about the Baileys. <laughs> no, sorry. I'm not, sorry. I'm not positive. Yeah, right. I'm not positive about that, so I won't spe speculate. Well, I, I, from what I understand, the wife was had the uh, the genealogy of Native American. the The original uh, Bailey husband was French English. Sounds right. Tyrone, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, uh, did you say that uh, Wolf Lake was four feet deep? Is that the deepest point? Is four feet? In in the 1896 map, the deepest part was four feet. Today, it's 17, maybe deeper in places, depending upon where you go. So today okay. it's much, much deeper, but in the past it was quite shallow. Okay, so today it's about 17 feet deep? It gets down at least to 17. It might get deeper than that, you know, give or take, 20-ish. Okay. The American Indian Center, is that a place that's still around in Chicago somewhere? Yes, absolutely. My last slide, I had a picture of their new location, which is in Right, where, where is it located? Um, Do you happen to know? Yeah, it's... I don't remember. I don't remember exactly, but it's like what if, if you go far down on on Wilson Avenue, uh, it's oh, you know, maybe 
It's on it's on Wilson Avenue. I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah, the original Native American center was at Wilson and uh near Ashland. But uh, yeah. I went by there recently and it's it's now condos. It's a, it's a great building. I think it was built for the center. But the, uh, address, the address here says 3401 West Ainsley. Ainsley. Oh, okay. Ainsley. So that's an east west street. So that's off of Wilson. Um 3400 is like California Avenue. Yeah. 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 California and Ainsley. Yeah. I remember when that American Indian Center was uh was on Wilson though. I used to live up there. So I remember that. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's no longer there now. Not on well, but it's in a former school building now. It's a much bigger place than they ever had before. Oh. Uh, it's really vibrant. There's a lot going on there. Oh, cool. Okay. Uh, I, we said a lot about the Indian tribe, but uh, there, was there any mention about uh, Indian burial grounds? Oh, yeah. Uh, the uh, the anchor site, uh, which is uh, uh, a Native American site in the Calumet region, is a was a burial site. There was a mound. And where is that? Lo what, what location? Well, <laughs> they, the state of Illinois keeps the location secret. <laughs> Oh, um, no wonder we can't find it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, good point. Yeah, people will go there uh, and, and loot the sites. Yeah, because I live in Roberts, and there are people that are constantly telling me that there are Potawatomi grave sites here, but nobody can tell me exactly where. So, and the ones that were doing all that talk is now dead. So I'm trying mm -hmm. to uh, uh, see if it's possible to locate some of those. The South so Suburban area... The South suburban area has a lot of Native American sites, um, and so it's and and there has been excavations of a number uh, that included burial sites, uh, but now pretty much archaeologists try to stay away from burial sites um, because it's uh, insensitive uh, to Native American people. So, if the state of Illinois is keeping secret the location of these sites then um, are, does that mean that they're doing something to preserve them or make sure they're not just turned into a bunch of parking lots or something? And are they, are they working with the native community? I understand why, why the archeologists are not, are not you know, digging them up, but what, what about the native community? How are they responding to this? Well, that's a really good question and a deep one. Native Americans don't generally like archaeologists. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, uh, not found in museums either. <laughs> in, in some cases, in, in the field museums has done some things to make that <laughs> uh, more the case. Um, what the state of Illinois policy is, uh, they want to know, the, they want to know where the sites are, but they don't distribute the information but they have information about where known sites are so that if a federally funded project is taking place, there will be a review to ensure that that project uh, doesn't damage that site, or if it's gonna be damaged, then they'll try to excavate it first. But that doesn't sound like they're working with the native community. I think there's, yes, I think there's not a lot of working with the Native American community. And I, and I don't mean that to completely to disparage the Department of Natural Resources in Illinois, which handles historic preservation for the state. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got one person <laughs> right. who's doing this. Sure. No, I understand. Excuse me, but I, I think I remember, uh, I remember reading years ago about how Chicago got its name Chicago, but can you uh, refresh my memory on how that happened and by whom and for what reason? There that seems name to be Chicago general service? agreement that it's the wild garlic plant that Chicago is named after. The what? The wild garlic plant. Wild garlic plant? Yep. It's not the wild onion? Uh, and I, I think there's a the really, the, la the last thing I've seen by historian John Svensson was wild garlic is what he said. Uh, yeah, there's a like a native 
plant, you know, swamp plant that's kind of like between garlic and onion. <laughs> I, I, I know it sounds funny, but I've actually pulled it up and tried it. And yeah, it's, a, it's very garlic like. So there are and no bark. It's so I'm sorry. So What's there, that? Are no, there, there are no bar fights over whether it's onion or garlic. <laughs> no, right, no, no, not that I understand. Okay. No. Okay. It's it's a whole separate plant, and so they're calling it a wild garlic. Yeah, I'm I'm sure they don't precisely know what the Chicago uh, plant was, uh, but I know that there are several different kinds of plants in the region still in in the wetlands in the region that if you told me hey is this garlic i'd say yeah boy it's pretty close yeah okay okay <laughs> so who coined who made it possible that the, the city would be called chicago though who was behind that was it the indians or the white man or who the, those are frenchmen was a frenchman they, they asked the they ask the Indian, what is this place? And the Indian tells them. And then based on how they heard it, they try to turn it into, you know, letters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first French letters and then later English letters. Okay. Ted, this, this it's idea that a mistranslation of some sort. I, I love this idea. And this is the first time I think I've heard you bring it up that the Calumet, the name Calumet meant the peace, you know, it, it had roots in peace and that the region itself was not a scene of war, that there was this sort of cooperation among the tribes. Uh, I, I, I guess you can see where I'm going with this. I'm trying to incorporate it into a, a modern story of the essence of that of the Calumet region was rooted in peaceful relationships between groups of people. That is a very thought provoking um, historical aspect to this. <laughs> Ted's, Ted's still processing it. <laughs> he's, he's not gonna he's not gonna step into that one until he's got some time to think about it. <laughs> no, I mean I, I I talked about it because I I, I think it's worth considering. Um, you you want to go yeah, too far with it? That's a great concept. Remember yeah. remember the other name, yeah. uh, uh, Quadouche, uh, is an Iroquois word for Potawatomi. The Iroquois, however, they were coming here and attacking the local tribes. So it, was, it wasn't all uh, kumbaya. Oh, the, the, okay. So the, the, it wasn't entirely a peaceful region. Yeah. It's, yeah. Fights I mean, over resources, that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, there's, it's a whole big part of, of the early history of the region, what they call the Iroquois Wars, where these New York tribes are coming in and trying to take over the hunting grounds of all the indigenous uh, Algonquin peoples. Uh, and uh, eventually the Algonquins prevail with help from the French. Huh. Wow. Was there any uh, idea of, um... Is there any record of Native American interaction with Wolf Lake in particular? You know, I've not seen anything, but I never looked specifically for that, uh, Dave. Yeah. Huh. Uh, can I ask? I know there's, I, I remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. I just want to know, uh, too, about John Baptiste Polk de Sable. Uh, he's supposed to have married an Indian woman. Is that correct? Absolutely. 
What do we know what tribe she was associated with? She was a Potawatomi. She was a Potawatomi. They had two children. Um, they had two children. And he eventually, and and he was raising them at his uh, place on the North Branch of the Chicago River uh, uh, before he moved uh, uh, moved away. But those kids were basically raised there uh, and a little bit in the Calumet region. Um, and uh, yeah, no, he, uh, his wife was critical to his business success. How's that? Well, she had the connections with the local tribe. Uh, and so that ensured customers uh, for him, uh, made him a trustworthy partner. And so they had no problem having him live amongst them. Okay. So uh, is she buried here? Uh, and, and I know his body has never been found, but uh, I mean, there's rumors and speculation about where, where, where his body is. But uh, what about his wife? Is is has, is is, is uh, her burial uh, location uh, known? Uh, his last sighting, of course, was um, in Missouri, um, and uh, his wife was dead by then. Uh, so we don't know. She just kind of vanishes from the scene. She was dead by then, or before then? She was well when he's. She dead, died before him. Yeah, when he's out in St. Louis or in Missouri, he uh, makes an arrangement with some local people to kind of cook and take care of him. So clearly his, his wife's not there. And what about his children? There, we have no idea. We don't know, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ted, is, is there much um there's scholarship coming out of the DuSable Museum about DuSable's life and connection with the Calumet? Um, the people who have researched this most deeply are not directly involved with the DuSable Museum. Uh, I think the DuSable Museum mm. you know, tries to pull together materials uh, uh, about his life. Uh, and certainly they have exhibits, uh, but uh, it's mainly people who've studied the early Native American and fur trade history of the region. I understand that Northeastern uh, Indiana University over in Gary has a large collection on the uh, Lake Michigan area. Have you, are you familiar with that collection they have there of early Wolf Lake and uh, those areas? I have not researched there, no. Thanks okay. for mentioning that, Tyrone. Yeah, they do. They have uh, maps, some uh, really old... Tyrone, are you talking about the uh, Indiana University um, extension in Gary? Yes. I know they, 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 I think they did a bunch of recordings with people from the Calumet about their experience. I, I haven't uh, they looked have... into it either. Um, yeah, they have some interesting. Are, are weird. Yeah, they have some very interesting old maps dating back to the time of the Indians. Uh, well, yeah, I remember some years ago huh. they, on a tour over there, and it was quite interesting. Michael, Michael, I wonder if they I wonder if there's somebody there that would be willing to talk for one of our Kelly Met Nature exchanges from that place that that Tyrone is talking about. Are you aware of it or? Yes, I am, um, but not recently. Um, um, yeah, it's, they're located, I think, on the third floor of the uh, main library. And um, the, the person that's in charge now, you know, just the other day, I, I ran across the name. I can't remember where I put it, but um, but I think you just email email them and um, and find out who's in charge of it now. They 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 changed them. Um, you know, I I've tried Michael. I've tried a couple times the calls and emails, and I um, I don't get anywhere. I don't get any reply. Um, let me. Um, gosh, I think the guy that put it together retired. Right, yeah. and he's he's on um, 
on he's still on staff there, or at least he's mentioned. But there is a, a, a person that replaced him. And let me go through my paperwork and see if I can run him down because I I I think I may have I may have him on my um, I, uh, on my list of um, on my computer somewhere. So I'll, if I can I, I can find it. It may take me a day or so. But I'll I'll find it and, and get it to you, Dave. Thanks. But it's, I was surprised um, that I ran across it, and I and I can't remember how I did that. But anyway, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get I'm, there. It's I'm a great center. It's a it's a great area, um, and um, you you just might just go visit the library and go up to the third floor, <laughs> and uh, you'll run into them. Um, All right. But it's a it's a, a a lot of lot of stuff there, and I know my wife had donated some things there, and what they ship them down to Indianapolis. Yeah, to be digitized. Yeah, so to be digitized, and so I don't know if they return. <laughs> um, but it's Lisa. Yeah, I I would if you ever have the time. I'd yeah, probably, I'll have to. I'll have to, I wrote, I made notes. <laughs> and okay. Ted, do you have an email that you'd be willing to share? And Kate, you are a wealth of information. And I just sit here thinking about how many other people, you know, in, in our area, you know, to share that information you have about the Indians and about, you know, the Calumet region. So. Yeah, I mean, just go to the Loyola University History Department and. Okay. Got a whole webpage there and, you know, click on send a message. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate everybody for stopping by. Um, and um, next, uh, our next meeting is April 18th. And uh, with a speaker to to be announced. Um, but anyway, thank you everyone for uh, stopping by. And thank you, Michael, for putting this thank together. You. This is really fascinating. Yeah, really good job. Okay. Yeah. Extremely interesting. I really appreciate it. Thank you.